buongiorno agli amici italiani, grazie a tutti per aver risposto in maniera così numerosa. È un piacere avere con noi Charlie quest'oggi. Eh, per chi pochi immagino non lo conoscesse, eh, audio, mh, è un uh, ingegnere audio, è un uh, inventore americano che mh, rappresenta un esperto nel disegno dei loudspeaker, nei processi di misura dei loudspeaker. È inoltre esperto in sistemi di misura e previsione e modellamento acustico. Ha lavorato per 14 anni per la Pidei Electronics ed è, eh, tra le altre cose interessanti, anche l'autore del primo eh, brevetto eh, riguardante la guida d'onda quadrata no? che oggigiorno viene impiegata nei moderni loudspeaker. Charlie ha studiato fisica eh, al Georgia Institute of Technology e suo docente è stato Eugene Patronis, uno degli autori del eh, famoso libro giallo Sound System Engineering insieme a Don Davis e al nostro amico Pat Brown. <coughs> Prima dell'introduzione eh, della presentazione di Charlie, consentitemi una serie di chiarimenti ehm, che sono argomenti propedeutici a quella che sarà la trattazione di Charlie e che esporrò per questioni di tempo in forma ridotta. Per chi volesse approfondirli può consultare i miei articoli sul blog Il lato oscuro della fase oppure consultare i webinar nel corso di questi giorni di quarantena prodotti che sono disponibili come registrazioni in seno al mio canale YouTube. Parleremo sì di allineamento tra subwoofer e main eh, in un contesto di live concert, ma questo ovviamente significa che parliamo di un argomento abbastanza complesso, suscettibile di numerose variabili. Come allineare cosa e perché è una scelta ehm, importante, una scelta complessa che mette in gioco tutta una serie di eh, variabili, di processi che devo necessariamente tenere in considerazione. Come, cosa e dove allineerò dipende dal programma musicale che si andrà ad eseguire quella particolare sede, in quel particolare contesto, dipende anche però dalla tipologia di sorgente presente sul palco. Cosa c'è sul palco? Una rock band con un backline che suona quanto un PA? Oppure uno, ci sono degli attori, un singolo strumento? Okay. Quindi il programma e le sorgenti sonore sul palco sono importanti, così come importanti sono anche eh, questioni più pratiche, più materiali, come le problematiche logistiche, quanto spazio a disposizione, le strutture montate, i mezzi e le risorse umane a mia disposizione, che si scopre poi paradossalmente essere quelle, quelle variabili molto spesso determinanti anche rispetto a tutti quei piani A, B, C e D che in fase di disegno mi avevo, avevo preventivato. La realtà conta quindi, tutta la realtà di contorno in cui il sistema sonoro è immerso protagonista del disegno e tuning del sistema, dei sistemi di rinforzo sonoro non è il sistema sonoro stesso, che è soltanto una delle variabili in gioco. Protagonista è la realtà intorno e special modo le stanze, le room, dove per room intendo io l'ambiente chiuso, piccolo o grande, così come l'ambiente aperto o confinato. In questa eccezione io parlo di room. Per alcuni mh, ambiti teorici le stanze sono mh, considerate sistemi lineari e tempo invarianti. Se questo assunto può essere mh, considerato in linea generale eh, valido, perché le stanze sono formate da pareti mh, caratterizzate da dimensioni che non variano grosso modo nel tempo, quindi io posso prevedere il loro comportamento nel tempo. Se intendiamo questo con sistema di lineare e tempo invariante, l'accezione della frase è giusta, ma questo non vuol dire che le stanze siano protagoniste passive del fenomeno sonoro. Esse sono protagoniste attive, anzi diventano parte principale del fenomeno sonoro perché lo modificano, lo modellano, diventano strumenti musicali esse stesse. Le stanze, le room, sono formate da pareti che in parte riflettono il suono che su esse incide, in parte lo trasmettono, lo trasmettono negli ambienti adiacenti che a loro volta si attivano. 
entrando in gioco nel fenomeno sonoro il più delle volte, in parte trasmettono questa energia sonora accumulata, stop the video please, in parte eh, trasmettono questa energia in seno alle strutture, innescando fenomeni di vibrazioni di, eh, di tipo modale che vanno a filtrare, a restituire nell'ambiente in cui ci troviamo una copia oltre che filtrata, anche ritardata e non correlata del segnale originario che su essa, sulla parete, aveva impattato. E guarda caso, questi fenomeni si vanno a localizzare proprio nel range operativo per la maggior parte dei nostri amati subwoofer. La stanza è la regina del tuning, ok? Essa filtra in maniera univoca il segnale in essa immesso, ogni stanza lo filtra in maniera univoca e questa mh, caratteristica specifica, questa impronta sonora, questa signature, la ritroviamo tutta nella room impulse response, uno sguardo tecnico nel dominio del tempo che mh, mh, si avvicina molto a quello che è il nostro primo approccio con il fenomeno sonoro. Il nostro primo approccio con il fenomeno, con il fenomeno sonoro riguarda variazioni pressorie rispetto ad una pressione di riferimento, la soglia dell'udito, nel tempo. E questo è vagamente no? molto vicino a quello che io visualizzo nella room impulse response, variazioni pressorie nel tempo. Quindi uno strumento elitario, privilegiato, di sguardo, di analisi al fenomeno sonoro. Ogni stanza ha la sua specifica room impulse response, ogni punto della stessa sala ha la sua specifica room impulse response. L'analyzer trasformerà con operazioni più complesse questa informazione nel dominio del tempo in un'informazione complessa nel dominio della frequenza in termini di spettro oppure di magnitudo e fase. Protagonista del disegno, dicevamo, non è la configurazione di subwoofer, non è il sistema sonoro, perché quella che può essere una soluzione ottimale in una previsione di un software mh, adimensionale semplice eh, può risultare nella realtà la peggiore delle soluzioni, ok? Quindi la forma della sala, la sua struttura, le sue caratteristiche determinano le nostre scelte e quindi anche le scelte di tuning. Protagonisti della realtà intorno sono i subwoofer stessi, ok? Un subwoofer non è la sorgente puntiforme teorica o considerata dal software tale in base alla teoria. Un subwoofer è un dispositivo complesso che spalma nel tempo la risposta all'impulso, il segnale che in esso entra. Praticamente se immetto in ingresso nel subwoofer un impulso unitario in cui tutte le frequenze istantaneamente di quel segnale entrano nel subwoofer, in uscita avrò uno smirico temporale della risposta all'impulso perché le frequenze avranno subito ritardi eh, diversi, differenti, nell'attraversare il sistema. Okay? Questo smearing temporale è tanto più complesso, incominciamo ad inquadrare il discorso, quanto più complessa è la sua realizzazione, il suo disegno, il suo processing elettronico. I subwoofer sono, sono um, sistemi dotati di una loro fisicità, inevitabilmente sono fatti da scatole, da enclosure, che hanno effetti importantissimi sulla risposta del subwoofer, soprattutto quando poi il subwoofer viene messo insieme in array insieme ad altri subwoofer. Più è complesso l'array di subwoofer e più varia la risposta del singolo subwoofer in termini di direzionalità, in termini di risposta in frequenza. È un po' come avviene per gli effetti dei palchi che sono innescati dalle, dagli array di subwoofer che amiamo collocare in, pro, collocare in prossimità di essi, eh, determinano variazioni della risposta che io leggo in, in termini di magnitudo quando vado a realizzare misure di transfer faction nell'analyzer, nell nel dominio della frequenza, variazioni, cancellazioni, enfatizzazioni della risposta in frequenza, della traccia, della magnitudo, che si ripercuotono anche in maniera intrinseca e correlata con variazioni della traccia della fase, di phase shift, di group delay. Ok? Perché avviene questo? Perché parliamo di effetti e di sistemi che sono minimum phase, qualcosa che avviene in termini di magnitudo e facilmente prevedibile come effetto in termini di fase, di lettura della traccia della fase, di phase shift. Okay. 
Questo vuol dire che mh, la traccia che noi leggiamo, la traccia della fase che noi leggiamo, è qualcosa di complesso, che non contempla soltanto il sistema, ma contempla gli effetti della complessità del sistema, sì, e della complessità della realtà in cui il sistema è immerso, sta suonando, sta operando. Infine, consideriamo anche gli effetti del pubblico su quello che è l'allineamento, tra virgolette, no, del nostro sistema di subwoofer rispetto ad un main, perché la gente, oltre alle sue proprietà acustiche, in quanto superficie acustica assorbente che modifica le caratteristiche acustiche della sala, è anche una sorta di pannello fonoassorbente che progressivamente riempie la sala e con zone di densità variabile innesca tutta una serie di fenomeni che vanno a modificare i percorsi dei fronti d'onda generati dai nostri subwoofer in contesto di live concert. Okay? Per dettagli sugli effetti del, dell'audience, sugli effetti dei palchi, sugli effetti dell'enclosure, vi rimando alla lettura degli articoli sul mio blog. Questo fa sì, ad esempio, con l'arrivo dell'audience, dell'intero numero di pubblico, di spettatori, che l'allineamento fatto in corso d'opera, in, eh, in fase di sound check, quando la sala è piena, necessariamente dovrà, eh, necessiterà di un ritocco in termini di allineamento temporale per il phase shift introdotto con l'arrivo del pubblico. La tendenza odierna è quella di arrivare sul posto collocare un microfono da qualche parte, aprire l'analyzer in modalità transfer fraction, visualizzando quella che è la transfer fraction di un sistema in modalità nel dominio della frequenza, quindi magnitudo e fase, guardare la traccia della magnitudo e ricamare con operazioni di equalizzazione la risposta del sistema alla ricerca che so, di una traccia flat, oppure facendo overlappare la risposta del sistema su una traccia di riferimento disegnata sullo schermo così come guardare alla traccia della, della fase, per, al plot della fase, per allineare, far overlappare in maniera geometrica tracce di fase. Questo ovviamente è dettato anche nel contesto live concert da, dagli, dai stretti tempi a disposizione, no? come dicevo prima, anche questo fa parte delle variabili in gioco e veramente nel live concert c'è poco tempo a disposizione, però tendenzialmente questa... È un'operazione che dimentica alcune cose importanti come i limiti degli analyzer, soprattutto i limiti della transfer fraction visualizzata nel dominio della frequenza. E ci e corriamo il rischio di dimenticare quella che è la complessità della realtà che incide sulla risposta del sistema che abbiamo testé citato. È vero, no? lo sentiamo ripetere molto spesso, no? eh, l'analyzer consente di passare dal dominio del tempo al dominio della frequenza. La transfer fraction visualizzata nel dominio del tempo è la misura di input response. La transfer fraction del sistema misurata, visualizzata in termini di magnitudo e fase nel dominio della frequenza è altresì derivata dalla prima o viceversa. Questo significa che ci sono dei layer di applicazioni matematiche a vari livelli che introducono approssimazioni a vari livelli. E l'ottenimento di una transfer fraction nel dominio della frequenza, quindi in termini di magnitudo e fase, è tendenzialmente un'operazione più complessa che richiede all'analyzer interpretazioni, approssimazioni ed errori indotti a livello superiore rispetto a quello che è l'ottenimento di una input response, poi ovviamente dipende dalla tipologia di eh, analisi ed elaborazione effettuata. In natura dell'universo tutti i sistemi aumentano nel tempo la propria energia ed inevitabilmente anche i nostri sistemi sonori il nostro ambiente in cui il sistema sonoro sta operando, inevitabilmente nel tempo aumenteranno la loro entropia. Qualsiasi sistema in natura, soggetto alle nostre scelte, soggetto ai nostri processamenti o per sua natura stessa, naturalmente evolve da un grado di ordine maggiore a un grado di disordine minore. Evolve dall'ordine al disordine, questo è inevitabile. E succede che mh, la transfer fraction, per sua intrinseca natura, per la matematica che la caratterizza, eh, eccetera, 
tendenzialmente che questo disordine aumenta, nel tempo perda la propria efficacia, risultando più utile, più efficace nel, nel campo eh, del, del suono diretto, piuttosto che ad esempio eh, nel campo degli elementi più tardivi nel tempo, caratterizzati appunto da maggiori disordine. Lo vediamo ogni volta no? che abbiamo un analyzer, effettuiamo una misura di transfer faccio come magnitudo e fase, man mano che introduciamo la sala, eh, gli, le, gli aspetti eh, più tardivi delle componenti energetiche che la caratterizzano, man mano l'analyzer perde di consistenza, di efficacia statistica, la misura in un istante non è più uguale alla misura in un altro istante. Lo sguardo nel tempo invece, nel dominio del tempo, che dal punto di vista tecnico è caratterizzato dalla misura di impulse response, è lo sguardo elitario privilegiato al fenomeno sonoro e a quella complessità, perché istantaneamente io ho ottenuto una impulse response che rappresenta il decadimento temporale del fenomeno sonoro che sto eh, misurando, nella sua piena risoluzione. Poi, a differenza di quello che avviene nel dominio della frequenza visualizzando una traccia di magnitudo, in questo caso, in sede successiva di analisi, posso decidere quale time span applicare alla intera impulse response e quindi posso essere selettivo sui singoli contributi energetici che leggo sul, nella impulse response, perché io qui ho ben visualizzati immediatamente, istantaneamente, quello che è il suono diretto, quello che è early energy, quella che è late energy, quella che è energia diffusa se presente, oppure il rumore di fondo. E questi sono gli ingredienti che posso manipolare sapientemente per il disegno di un sistema sonoro o per le mie scelte di tuning lì subito a portata di mano nella impulse response. Iniziando nel dominio del tempo, io porto l'ascolto e il suo lato tecnico, la impulse response, al centro di tutte le scelte di disegno e di tuning di un sistema di rinforzo sonoro. In questo contesto la persona diventa protagonista, non passiva, attrice di quelle che sono le scelte preimpostate dell'analyzer per le misure di, di transfer faction nel dominio della frequenza. La persona al centro di tutte le nostre scelte e improvvisamente gli analyzer elevati al ruolo che gli compete, ovvero quelli, quello di conferma o meno di quello che è l'intuito e l'esperienza dell'operatore. Ok, mi era doverosa questa brevissima introduzione. Uh, I leave place to Charlie for uh, his uh, presentation. Thanks to all and introduce Charlie. Thank you, Fidel. Um, let me share my screen. Um, all right. Um, yes, yeah, so... I'm going to change up the order of some things I was going to present just because one of the things that uh, Fajel just talked about, I think is extremely important. And I know a lot of people already know this and understand this, but it, it's so important. It, it's worth reiterating. Um, when we look at a transfer function in the frequency domain, and that's what's shown down here in, in the bottom section in Sistune is, is our transfer function. And in the top, Uh, is our impulse response in the time domain. To get uh, this transfer function in the frequency domain that's displayed here, we have to take the entire time record that's shown here in the time domain to get this resultant uh, frequency information. A consequence of that is that unless we're measuring in an anechoic chamber or outdoors or a very, very large room, a lot of times we're not able to isolate the direct sound from the loudspeakers only. So we're all this stuff that's happening after here is reflections uh, from various surfaces within the room and reverberation. And all of that has an influence on what we see in the frequency domain. If we wanted to see only what's coming out of the loudspeaker directly 
and no uh, reflected en energy, like I said, we'd have to measure outside or we'd have to put a window um, around some of the very early arriving energy. And still, if we limit this uh, to only 30 milliseconds, like I'm showing here, it's still not enough to isolate only the direct sound. And if I window that, um, well, it's not showing the, the full window. In any event, the important thing to understand here is that it's this entire time record that is uh, we have to take into account when we look in the frequency domain. And that's the root of some of our problems when we try to do a time alignment in the frequency domain. This reflected energy can corrupt the data. If we look at the time domain and only the early arriving energy, this stuff happening right here, um, that's much more important to us. So let me uh, jump over to the, the topics today. Um, and we'll talk about subwoofer alignments with, with full range system and doing that in, in the time domain. Um, some of the items I'm gonna address today uh, is looking at an impulse response of high pass and low pass devices. Uh, after all, that's what we're talking about. The, the low pass device is our subwoofer, the high pass device is our, our mains or our full range system. We'll look at alignment and misalignments of IRs and how that relates to the actual arrival time differences of those IRs. Uh, and I'll, I'll show an example of a time alignment with a subwoofer and a full range system uh, by looking at only the impulse responses and, and how to accomplish that uh, in, in the field where you can actually put it to good use. Um, one of the things that goes hand in hand with that is where do I put my measurement microphone to, to perform those measurements? So we'll look at uh, a method to tell us where should be a reasonably good place to, to put our measurement mic. Uh, and correlated with that is putting the measurement mic and doing a time alignment, taking the entire venue or a majority of the venue into account so that we can minimize the response variations through the crossover region between our subs and our mains for a majority of the locations um, in, our, in our room, in our audience area. So first thing we do is look at the, uh, an impulse response. Now this is a, a perfect impulse response at time zero. Uh, you can see on the left, uh, the time domain representation of the impulse response, and on the right, uh, the magnitude response in the frequency domain, completely flat magnitude response as you would expect. Now, if we apply um, a low pass and high pass filter to that impulse response, so these are the, the two IRs that we would get as a result. Uh, and this is for uh, fourth order Linkwitz Riley low pass and high pass filters at, at one kilohertz. And you can see that um, in the, the magnitude response in the frequency domain. And you're probably asking, why is he showing me one kilohertz crossover filters here? Uh, this has nothing to do with subwoofers. You're exactly right. However, I want to start with an example that's a little bit easier to see in the time domain and explain some things and give us a, a foundation for, for some of the, the items that I'll, I'll present later. And, and this is a, a good start. And we'll move down in frequency uh, a little bit later. Now, if we look at those filters, zoom in vertically to see what's going on a little bit, we can see some things that I've called out here. Um, you can easily see where the peak energy arrival of each of those impulse responses are. Uh, and that's nice to know, but of more importance is when the initial energy arrival is occurring. And that's occurring for both of these impulse responses at time zero, at t equals zero, right here. We haven't applied any delay to either of these uh, impulse responses. All we did was apply our Linkwitz Riley low pass and high pass filters. So there has been no broadband delay here. The initial arrival is still occurring at time zero. 
if we add those two uh, IRs back together again, uh, say at the output of a mixer or at a perfect loudspeaker, let's say, uh, this is the resultant Im impulse response that we get. Uh, the magnitude response is perfectly flat, just as you'd expect when you add two Linkwitz Riley uh, crossover filters together. But our impulse response is smeared out in time due to the phase shift of each of those low pass and high pass filters. And that's to be expected with, with those particular filters. There's, there's no way around that. And um, inherently with uh, IIR filters, there, there's no way to correct that either. Now, a lot of people might say, well, we should align the, the peak energy arrival of uh, those IRs and that'll give us a, a better resultant IR. Um, that's, that's not correct, but we can go through that exercise to see what happens. So here I've delayed the, the high pass uh, filter signal by uh, just under half a millisecond. Uh, so that the peak energy arrival of both of those impulse responses are aligned. Now, when we add those together, uh, we see the uh, resultant impulse response shown in green. Now, if we look at that in the frequency domain, we see something that initially might not be expected. There's about a 20 dB cancellation right at the crossover frequency. Uh, if we think about what we did to our IRs, it'll easily become evident why that happened. We delayed the high pass impulse response about half a millisecond. At our crossover frequency of one kilohertz, half a millisecond is uh, half a period or half a wavelength. So right at the crossover frequency, we've put these two uh, signals, these two impulse responses out of phase 180 degrees. And that's why we're getting this large cancellation uh, right at the crossover region. So hopefully this gives you a good visualization of why you don't wanna align the peak energy arrival of signals that have uh, dissimilar frequency content. If they have similar frequency content, things change a little bit, but when one, uh, one device has much more high frequency energy in it than the other one does, it's not the peak energy arrivals uh, that uh, we want to align and concentrate on. So now let's move down in frequency a little bit, get closer to our, our subwoofer region. Uh, again, we've got fourth order Linkwitz Riley filters, but this time at 100 Hertz. Uh, and you can see it's very difficult to see what's going on um, in the uh, impulse response. We really have to zoom in to see that. Now, the reason that occurs is when we look at the impulse response in the time domain, that's naturally biased towards high frequencies. They're going to be uh, more dominant in, in the time domain when looking at the impulse response. The, the reason that is, it, it, if we look at what's going on over in the right in, in the frequency domain, that's plotted on a logarithmic frequency axis. That's how we're usually used to working in the audio industry. If we were to plot that same, exact same graph on a linear frequency scale, you wouldn't hardly be able to see that, that red low pass uh, signal at all. All you'd see was the blue. And when we look at the impulse response in the time domain, that's sort of the equivalent of, of what we're seeing. It's very difficult to see what's going on uh, with, with the IRs that don't have a lot of high frequency content. So if we zoom in on that vertically to tell a little bit better about what's going on, this is very similar to what we saw with the one kilohertz filters, only if you look at the time scale, um, that low pass signal shown in red is smeared out even more in, in the time domain. So things can become a little more difficult to tell when that initial energy arrival is happening. Again, we have not applied any delay here, so the initial energy arrival is still at time zero. But it's a lot more difficult to see when that is because of uh, the slow rise time of that low-passed IR at 100 hertz. 
So one of the things that I, um, I will do when I'm doing time alignments and looking at things in the time domain is I will not have a low pass filter uh, on my subwoofer or the uh, low frequency pass band of a full range system that I'm trying to align with the mids or the highs. I want as much high frequency energy to come out of that device as possible because that allows me to, to get a better indication of when that uh, energy is, is actually arriving. So if we go back and look at the time domain uh, at these IRs, we, we see that that apparent gap, uh, that apparent time gap um, in the initial portion of the low pass IR uh, is not due to any broadband delay. Um, it's due to really two things that, that are occurring with that uh, impulse response and the filter that, that we put on it. There's a lack of high frequency energy content uh, and that's one of the main things causing that apparent time delay gap or that apparent time gap. The other is the, the phase shift of the filter in, uh, in that low frequency region. And neither one of those can be corrected by a broadband delay, nor should we try, uh, as you could, could uh, tell by the example that I showed earlier when we tried to, to apply delay to, uh, to, to make it better, but that was not the result. So uh, let me jump over to SysTune for a minute and we'll look at some things there. Uh, let me try to get the, these windows turned off for just a minute. I apologize. Okay, there we go. Um, so we've already looked at that example. Uh, let me turn that off. Now, one of the things in SysTune uh, that we'll be utilizing and I want to introduce you to is uh, the ability to use a bandpass filter. Uh, that's shown here. And actually, we're just gonna use the upper frequency limit of that bandpass filter. So basically, it's, it's gonna be a low pass filter. Um, I'll start a measurement here, uh, and this is just a loop back measurement that I'm doing. So you see perfectly flat amplitude response down here and a perfect impulse response. But if I go over here and engage this low pass filter, um, this is a brick wall uh, linear phase filter. So you can see in the magnitude response, it just cuts the, uh, the response off right there. If I zoom in in the time domain to look at the IR, note that everything seems symmetrical about time zero. Let me turn it off and you'll see that perfect impulse response again. When I turn on the bandpass filter, uh, or this low pass filter actually, because it's a linear phase filter, you're gonna see things happening before time zero. Uh, the time response has to be symmetrical about the center for it to be linear phase. So that's why we see uh, things uh, that start to occur before time zero. Um, I, I just wanted to show you that because we'll see it in some other examples as we move forward. Uh, and I didn't want it to confuse folks too much. Um, I'll change this to 125 hertz and you can see things spread out uh, even a little bit more. And now we're seeing that brick wall down at, at 125. Okay, so let me stop that. And now we'll look at some examples with some filters. Again, I'm using filters uh, to initially show what's going on. They're a little bit easier to visualize, especially in the time domain, to get a handle on what's actually happening. So uh, here you can see our ideal subwoofer in blue and our ideal full range loudspeaker in green. Now I've processed uh, this measurement to apply this brick wall filter uh, at 125, just like you could measure using SysTune 
uh, when you're at a show out uh, trying to measure the setup for your system. Now, if we look at that in the, the time domain, this is what we see. And I'm gonna zoom in a little bit better so you can see what's going on. And we haven't applied any delay to these signals. So they're still occurring at time zero. Um, and I did not apply this brick wall filter to the subwoofer. Um, it already has its high frequency energy content minimized because of that low pass filter. Ideally, I'd like to, to eliminate that, to bypass that low pass filter or run it up to one or two kilohertz and let more energy come out so I can see when that uh, initial energy arrival happens. But a lot of manufacturers don't allow you to change their presets uh, for the subwoofers for the full range system. Uh, so a lot of times you, you don't have the luxury of doing that. So we'll apply that, that bandpass filter uh, right here that I talked about earlier to eliminate the high frequency energy from the full range system. I don't do that for the, for the subwoofer uh, for two reasons. It doesn't need it. It's already naturally low passed. And also, I don't want to get that spreading uh, that you see in the red here. I want to see uh, my initial arrival time as much as I can for my subwoofer here at time zero. So you can see these signals are, they're actually already aligned because we haven't applied any delay to any, either of them. It's a little bit difficult to see that in, in this representation, even if I zoom in more, but I'll use another feature of Sistune. And this is um, a, a one octave bandpass filter applied to the impulse responses. And I'll do that at 125 Hertz. And I'll zoom in again vertically. And now you can see, uh, hopefully you can see that, yeah, these, two signals are aligned in time. And if I take the, um, that subwoofer signal, and I'm gonna add about six dB to that. This is after I've made my measurement, just so you can see it, I'll visualize it a little bit better. You can see that the, the, the peaks, the troughs, everything is time aligned. We have good time alignment here. So this is the kind of thing you're looking for in the time domain when you do a time alignment. That's the kind of thing you want to see. All right, so now let's look at this with some actual loudspeakers and see what things look like there. Here we've got um, a subwoofer in blue. Uh, a measured subwoofer, and in green, uh, uh, one element of a line array system. Um, and you can see the impulse responses up, up here uh, in, the, in the time domain representation. Uh, if I apply that 125 hertz uh, low pass filter right here, just like you would in, in the measurement, um, this is, is what I'm left with. That's the only thing left out of that uh, full range loudspeaker. Now, if we zoom in on that in the time domain, that's what we get. Now, again, applying that one octave fill, uh, bandpass filter at 125, this, this is the relationship we're left with. And I'll zoom in some more to see what's going on. And again, because the, the subwoofer looks lower in level because it has less high frequency content. You can see that down here in the, the frequency domain. So for the subwoofer, uh, I'm gonna add about 10 dB to that only so that I can visualize it better in the time domain. Now, um, when I did these measurements, I zeroed it uh, in time based on the full range loudspeaker. So the full range I already know is happening at, at time zero. I don't know exactly when my subwoofer is, uh, is arriving, but I know it's early. I can say that because if we look here, we see the initial uh, 
initial rise, let me get the cursor on the blue, here happening before time zero. And remember that uh, apparent gap that I mentioned earlier uh, on one of the other earlier slides I showed? Um, we're, we're not seeing that yet. So the uh, initial arrival of the sub could be over here someplace. But we know that the earliest we see any, any uh, upturn in the IR for the subwoofer is right here. And if I look at my cursor value down here, our cursor values displayed, I can see that that is about six milliseconds early. So let's look and see what happens when we delay this subwoofer signal uh, by about six milliseconds. I can do that in SysTune with my virtual EQ. Uh, I'll unlock that subwoofer IR so that um, our virtual DSP will be applied to it. And I'll apply six milliseconds of delay to that subwoofer signal. And now we see the result. And obviously this is not time aligned because our peaks and our troughs are happening um, at exactly the wrong time to each other. So we know we need to delay the subwoofer even more than this. We can't delay it any less because then that subwoofer energy will be arriving too soon. So we have to delay it more. And it looks like that if we put this peak coincident with this peak in the red, that's probably about what we need to do. So if I draw this line, I see that's about another five milliseconds or so, not quite five milliseconds. So let's add another five milliseconds of delay to our subwoofer. So that would make it 11 total. So with 11 milliseconds of delay on our subwoofer, it looks like we've got pretty good alignment uh, between that subwoofer and that full range loudspeaker. And in, indeed we do. Um, if we wanted to uh, look at the phase response, now they, these were measured outdoors, so uh, I, I can actually look at the magnitudes and phase responses and see what's going on. Um, let me turn that one back on so you can see what's going on. If we look at the phase response, we can see that, yeah, through the crossover region there around 85 hertz, we have really good phase alignment. But that's a byproduct of doing it properly in the time domain. Um, it'll always work going from the time domain and then looking at the phase. It doesn't necessarily always work aligning the phase and then looking at it in the time domain. You may or may not be truly time aligned. So I hope uh, looking at those examples is, is beneficial uh, and, uh, and you see what's going on there. So now let's move on uh, to the next topic, uh, which is setting some, some goals for establishing arrival time in, in a real room. Our ideal uh, thing we want to happen is have the energy from adjacent passbands, the, the subwoofer and the low frequency passband of our full range system um, to arrive at the listener at, at the same time. Um, and, and that reminds me one more thing I should go back over here and, and speak about. We see this alignment in, in the time domain. Uh, to me, that's a critically important aspect. Uh, we, we want good summation in the frequency domain through that crossover region. So we, we get that, uh, that good increase in energy, the constructive uh, summation that we want. But having things time aligned, that's what yields the, the impact, that punch that we get from a, a really well-tuned system. If these things are not aligned in time, uh, they could have the wrong crossover filters on them and still get good summation in the frequency domain. But under that condition, they're not going to have the punch and the impact that you really want uh, from a, a, a well-aligned system. When, when they're aligned in the time domain, you can see the peak energy arrivals of both the subwoofer 
and the low frequency part of the full range system occurring at the same time. That's what gives you that transient impact and, and that sense of authority and, and punch out of your system. Okay, so our goals for arrival time. Um, ideally, the subwoofers uh, and full range loudspeakers are located close to each other to minimize the arrival time differences, but that's not often the case. There, there are three typical cases uh, that we can run into for sound system deployments. Number one is an all ground stack system. Uh, the second is an all flown system. The third is flown full range and ground stack subs. That's the one we're gonna look at uh, for the following examples. And we do that for two reasons. Uh, one, it's a very commonly seen configuration and, and deployment for sound systems. And more importantly, it represents the worst case for timing differences and, and trying to overcome those. So that's what we're gonna concentrate on. Now, um, another thing we want to do, uh, or at least that I think is important to do, is to minimize the variation uh, within the crossover region over as much of the audience area as possible. And if we set out as a goal, as one of uh, our, our criterion, to have less than a 2 dB variation within that crossover region, then we can look at the time domain and see what we need to do to achieve that. So uh, to have less than a 2 dB uh, variation in the summation, the adjacent pass bands cannot be out of phase by more than 75 degrees. Uh, at 100 hertz, 75 degrees equates to about two milliseconds. So that's gonna be what, what we're looking at here. Now, I know this is a little higher than uh, typical crossovers. Um, the reason I'm doing this at 100 hertz is because most of the materials I developed for this were done in ease, and it has a low frequency limit of 100 hertz. If we shift everything down to 80 hertz, then this two milliseconds uh, gets even longer, uh, and we're more like two and a half milliseconds or so that things have to stay within. So um, you can scale uh, this time value down to whatever frequency your, your crossover's in. Um, but a, a good way to remember things, 2 dB variation, two milliseconds uh, of, of time variation, and that'll keep you good up to 100 hertz. So we're gonna look at things in, a, uh, in this example room. You can see the dimensions shown here uh, in the slides. Uh, it's a typical line array system with uh, subwoofers on the floor uh, directly below the array. And we're gonna look at only the direct sound here. We're not taking into account reflections off the walls, the ceiling, floor, anything like that. We're looking at direct sound only. Uh, to, to make things a little bit easier to visualize um, in, in this example. Now what we're seeing here is an arrival time difference map. What this shows us over our audience area is the difference in arrival time between the subwoofer and the flown full range loudspeaker system. And we can see that over a majority of the audience area, that arrival time difference, they, uh, it ranges from a value of around four milliseconds to about 10 milliseconds. And that's valid for a little over 90% of, uh, of the audience area. We see that there's the uh, smallest time arrival difference is back here in, in the back at about four milliseconds. And that's to be expected if, if you consider the, uh, the relative locations of the subwoofer and the, the full range system. You go down front, uh, you're on the floor closer to the subwoofer, farther away from the, the flown loudspeaker system above you. And as you get further away, you get closer to an equidistant uh, position between the two of them. So the way I approach um, the, the time alignment and this goes to where I want to put my measurement mic. I'd want to measure where I anticipate the smallest arrival time difference is going to be. And from doing a plot like this or looking at it, going somewhere in the venue and using a, 
uh, a laser range finder and seeing what the, the uh, different distance is to the subs and, and the, the mains, we can see where the smallest difference in distance is, and that's probably where we want to put our mic. So we see that's in the back of the room where we've got about a four millisecond uh, difference in time. And we're going to delay that uh, first arriving signal, which we know is the subwoofer because we're closer to that. We're going to delay the subs by that uh, difference in time plus an additional two milliseconds. That two milliseconds is uh, that difference that we talked about earlier here. That's where that two milliseconds comes from. So we want to over delay by two milliseconds. Uh, so we're going to put six milliseconds of delay on the subwoofer. And now let's look at what the arrival time difference is after we've applied that delay. As expected, we're plus two milliseconds in the back of the room because we've over delayed. And as we move forward, we get closer and closer to perfect time alignment where it's zero milliseconds here. And as we continue to move forward, uh, we start to get out of time alignment again towards the area where the subwoofer is going to be early. Now, the reason we do this over delay is, like I said, we want to have no more than a 2 dB error in our summation in the crossover region. So when we're two milliseconds out here, we'll have a 2 dB error. When we're two milliseconds out here, we'll have the same 2 dB error. So we've taken our 2 dB error. Uh, it's not a plus minus 2 dB. It's only 2 dB total, a zero to 2 dB. But because we're going plus 2 milliseconds to minus 2 milliseconds, we can now accomplish that only a 2 dB variation over a much broader audience area, a, a total of a four millisecond range, plus two milliseconds to minus two milliseconds for that same 2 dB maximum summation error. So we can make the, the summation better over a, a larger audience area. So now let's uh, compare what things look like um, the SPL at 100 hertz from our line array only uh, shown here on the left and the graph on the right uh, is our subs only. We can see closer down front the subwoofers are louder as expected because we're on the floor and as we move back in the venue things get to be closer to the same SPL. Now uh, on the left we still see the line array only but on the right, this is the summation between the subwoofers and the line array. And we can see, that, and no delay has been applied yet. We can see that we've got some areas of really bad cancellation, uh, about 9, 10 dB cancellation uh, in, in this area here. So if we apply the method I just detailed where we over delay our subwoofer and apply six milliseconds of delay, we get a condition that, that is actually very beneficial. That's what's shown in, in this SPL map. Uh, we get good positive summation everywhere, except this little area right down here. This is the only reason, region we have some destructive interference. Um, that's not great, but minimizing that area in percentage total audience area is, in my opinion, a, a very good thing. Uh, and even though we're getting some cancellation there, it's, it's not too bad. Uh, probably only, you know, an additional 2, 3 dB, something like that. So if we look at the frequency response, and again, these were idealized sources uh, that I was looking at uh, to make it easier to see what the summation is. But if we look at the frequency response here at the uh, uh, locations where I denoted the SPL, we see that we have very good summation through our crossover region of around 100 hertz. And as we move back in the venue, we can see that we maintain very good summation through the crossover region. The only thing that changes is the overall SPL because we're getting farther and farther away from, uh, from the sound source. So, 
hopefully that details for you where to where a good place to put your measurement mic is to to verify your time alignment uh, for a ground stack sub and and flown uh, full range loudspeakers. But what about a case where they're not uh, one right under the other? Let's say we have a horizontal offset. Uh, in this example, we still have our flown full range loudspeakers, uh, but now our subwoofer is a ground stack mono cluster uh, directly in the center. So where do we put the, the measurement mic then? The same principle of minimizing uh, the arrival time difference applies. So we want to be farther back in the venue because it's a ground stack sub and, and flown full range. So putting us farther back in the venue minimizes those time differences. And left to right, we want to uh, put the, the measurement mic about equidistant between the two. So that's why I've got that measurement mic about halfway left to right between the subwoofer and the, the house right full range loudspeaker. So we can look at a couple of things uh, in ease focus um, to, to see how that relates to this. And I'm, if you're not uh, used to modeling, um, I, I would suggest doing it. Ease focus is a free download to, uh, to end users. And you can use that to, to lay out your venues, uh, your loudspeaker placements, and get an idea of uh, the general. Well, it's not going to give you specific, but it'll give you general arrival time differences and let you see the areas where that arrival time difference should be minimized. So here's a layout in, in focus very similar to what I went over in, in the slides earlier. You've got your flown full range and your ground stack sub. And I've put some microphones here at various locations uh, similar to, uh, to where I showed the SPL. Now there's a tab uh, in focus called time response. And that's not going to give you the exact time response. It's only going to account for time of flight between the, the sound sources in, uh, in focus. But what this shows us is the the difference in arrival times um, between the, the full range and the subwoofer which, for whichever microphone we select. So if I select mic number three, we can see the subs and everything's normalized to the first arrival, which in this case is gonna be the subwoofer. And we can see the full range arriving a little over five milliseconds late. If I go back to the back of the venue at microphone five, we can see uh, the difference in arrival time there is uh, a little over four milliseconds, exactly uh, what I showed in, in the slide there. It was around four milliseconds. Uh, and this is for a, a flat floor. Um, that, that's the, the easiest case. Let's look at uh, a situation where we've got a raked floor and see how things change. So now there's a, an angle to our floor. Uh, if we look at our time response, and notice how as we move back in the venue, we're also moving up closer to the, the full range loudspeaker. So we should expect a smaller arrival time difference at this back microphone. And that's what we see. Now we're only about three milliseconds uh, time difference. So Hopefully this gives you a, a, a good idea, a good indication of uh, how things work, uh, what can be expected, and some of the things that you can do in, um, in doing time alignments for your, your systems. Uh, I hope that has, has been helpful for people to, to see the time domain representation uh, and how that works. Um, if, if folks have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to to try to answer them. Um, I don't know that I'll be able to answer everything, but I'll, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Hi there, Charlie. Hi there. Are you hearing now? Yes. Can yes. you hear? Yes. yes. Uh, not, not many questions here on the chat, but uh, I have one for you. Uh, how do we choose the best time window for full uh, range and sub alignment? Uh, in a highly reverberant space. 
Ah, that, that is a good question and, and something very difficult. Um, to, to choose the best time window, um, I'm assuming you're talking about the, the, the time of the window? <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, if, if your goal is to do an alignment of the subwoofer and, and the, the mains, the length of the time window has to be long enough to get good resolution down in the 40, 50, 60, 70 hertz region. So you can see what's going on with the loudspeaker um, if, if you're going to look in, in the frequency domain. Um, so to get accurate uh, frequency resolution in the 50 hertz region, let's say, you're going to have to have an absolute minimum of a 100 millisecond window. That's the minimum. Uh, it would be better to have a 200 millisecond window. So um, let me go back over to SysTune. Let me share my screen again for a moment. Um, and we can look at SysTune. Um, give me a moment to set this example back up again. We can look at what we were, were seeing before. Okay, so you've got this measurement and we wanna know how much we need to window it. Well, our initial arrival is here. Um, let me zoom in a little bit more. Uh, hopefully we can see better. Yeah, so going 200 milliseconds out from here would put us, well, past the end of the scale that, that I've, I've had. So you'd have to take all of this time domain information and include it before you FFT into the frequency domain to have enough frequency resolution to do anything actionable uh, to, so that you could make good decisions in the frequency domain. It's very difficult to do that unless you're measuring outdoors. And that's one of the prime benefits of working in the time domain. It doesn't matter what's happening out here if you stay in the time domain. It does matter when you go to the frequency domain because all of that information gets into your, your frequency plot. But in the time domain, we can just zoom in over here and see what's going on and what's happening way over here, you know, way out here doesn't matter at all. That's a great benefit of working in the time domain is that you don't have to worry about a time window, what length it is. You just look at the early part of, of the time domain. Um, I know that doesn't quite answer your question, um, but that's really what you have to take into account. Um, if you want actionable data in the frequency domain, your the length of your time window in the time domain has to be long enough to get good resolution there. Um, so it depends what frequency range you're looking at. Um, there's a I, typically I'll use maybe a 30 to 50 millisecond window. Uh, if I'm using a, a traditional window in, in SysTune, uh, that'll get me good information from, you know, a couple of hundred hertz up higher in frequency. Uh, SysTune also has what's called a TFC window, time frequency constant window. Uh, and instead of giving you uh, frequency resolution as a specific bandwidth, like a, uh, a 40 hertz resolution, the TFC window will give you a, a constant percentage octave bandwidth. So maybe if I'm using a TFC window, I'll use uh, a 10 millisecond window and that'll give me about one tenth octave resolution no matter what frequency I'm looking at. Okay, perfect answer. It's uh, uh, what we're looking for is the beginning, not uh, where it ends. That doesn't matter for us, that's the point here. Exactly. In, in the time domain, in, when you're working in rooms, and I'm assuming most people are working in enclosed spaces in rooms, what happens towards the end 
of the impulse response doesn't matter. All that's reflected energy. We, we really don't care about that. That's the realm of the acoustician. You can only do things towards the end of the impulse response when you start working with acoustical treatment. As system engineers, loudspeaker designers, we care about the front of the impulse response. That's where the direct sound from the loudspeaker occurs and that's where equalization can, can be a benefit. So we're always more interested in the early part of the IR because that's what we can control uh, with our, our sound systems. Yes. Uh, with us is also uh, Abe. I don't know if Abe has uh, any questions from Facebook. Uh, yeah. Um, I just got one from, now I'm going to pronounce this wrong. I'm going to say Cesar Pedraza asked, would you um, be able to go over again how you came up with uh, the two milliseconds that you added um, to the, the microphone at the back of the room? The, the two milliseconds you added to the, the base. Yes, absolutely. Uh, let me share my screen again and, and get back over to the, uh, the PowerPoint. Give me just a... A minute to do that. Um, okay, so what we're actually after here, the, the two milliseconds um, over delay comes from the criterion that we set out that we don't want any more than a 2 dB variation through our crossover region. Um, so to make sure that the summation through crossover doesn't change as a function of position within our audience area by more than 2 dB, the relationship, the phase relationship between the subwoofer and the LF of our full range can't be out of phase by more than 75 degrees. If, if they get to 80, 90, 100 degrees will be more than a 2 dB variation. If they stay within 75 degrees of phase, uh, we'll have no more than a 2 dB variation. Now, 75 degrees of phase shift at a frequency of 100 hertz equates to about two milliseconds. So that's where that value of, of two milliseconds comes from. And that's why I say over delay by about two milliseconds. Now, it's not always going to be possible uh, to, to over delay by two milliseconds um, because you may have some venues where, where things change a little bit. And I should go through to... Uh, the uh, conclusion slides here that I, I, I skipped earlier. Um, so to, to get the consistent response uh, throughout the crossover region within a relatively large audience area, um, when one device, either the sub or the mains, but it's when one device always arrives the earliest throughout that audience area, the, the four things you want to do are choose uh, your measurement location for your microphone where that difference in arrival time uh, is the smallest. Measure that difference in the initial arrival times uh, using that, that uh, bandpass filtered IR method I showed you in SysTune. Uh, determine that, uh, that difference in arrival time. And, and time align those. Look at the IRs and, and get those lined up just like I showed in SysTune, but then apply an additional two milliseconds to that earliest arriving signal. For, for the example I showed earlier, we, we needed to apply 11 milliseconds of delay to the subwoofer to get them perfectly aligned. To, to finish out, I'd add another two to make it 13 milliseconds. And then when time aligning, work in the time domain. Uh, to, to me, um, I, I can't stress that enough. You're, you're looking for a time-based answer. So it, to me, at least, it makes most sense that you would ask a time-based question. And you're going to find the answer to that in the time domain. You're going to find the answer more easily in the time domain. You could probably still get there in the frequency domain but you're introducing more variables and it's, it's more difficult to get there. Um, yes, it's gonna be a little harder to get your head wrapped around this when you're first starting it, 
but isn't that always the case when you first started doing anything having to do with sound? It, it was difficult until you did it uh, uh, you know, several times. The more you do it, the more you know what to look for, the easier it becomes. So start doing this process in, in the time domain and it'll become easier. Um, you know, if you're working with loudspeakers uh, from a manufacturer, you know, subs and mains from the same manufacturer, and, and they've given you the crossover filters that should work well with those uh, loudspeaker systems, when you go uh, and set them up, deploy them, really the only thing you should have to do is figure out what the time alignment is. That is easy as done in, in the, the time domain, because uh, those the, the good manufacturers will have applied the proper crossover filters uh, for their systems, and it'll be easier to find that, that answer in the time domain. Now, if you're doing your own crossovers, if you've got subs from one manufacturer and your mains are from a different manufacturer, you got to figure out what your crossover filters are going to be. Things uh, are a little bit different. In, in that case, um, you know, do the do the preliminary legwork in your shop or out in a parking lot somewhere. Uh, take your sound system out there where there are no reflections, where you can measure the direct sound in a large space and not have to apply a, a time window. Um, and you know, see what you need to do to time align those devices, and then uh, apply the appropriate crossover filters for them. Um, but that's something that once you do that, you'll have the right crossover filters for your sound system, even though it's from different manufacturers. And you can use that in any venue you go to. All, the only thing you've got to do in that venue based on the position of your loudspeakers is, again, time align them. Now, there may be some venues, say a venue that has a balcony. Um, you get into that balcony. Uh, and you may be a lot closer to the flown full range than to the sub. On the floor of the venue, you're closer to the sub than the full range. So in that instance, uh, it, you know, the early arrival time, the device with the earliest arrival time switches within, depending on where you are within that venue. Um, so the, the rules get a little bit different there. You can't always add that two milliseconds. It depends on what the difference in arrival time is. Um, if the, the difference in arrival time is less than two milliseconds, then add the required delay so that the later arriving device is two milliseconds after the earlier arriving device. If the difference in arrival times is already more than two milliseconds after the you know, the, the switch, then there's nothing you can be done. And that's just an artifact of the, the layout of the venue and where the loudspeakers are, are located. Uh, so you just have to, to make the best of it there and time align it for the place that you think is, is most important, probably closer to, to front of house mix position. I think there is time for one or two other questions. Uh, I can see one here from Joel Brito. Uh, when looking at low frequency information, would it help to reduce the sampling, the sampling frequency? For example, for 44, uh, 100 to 48 K. Uh, hi, Joel. Uh, good to hear from you. Um, I, I don't think so. I don't think changing the sampling rate um, would, would be of any help. Um, changing the sampling rate is, is not going to change the in, inherent nature or the time relationship between the, the mains and the subs. Um, it's just going to potentially further limit the what high frequency Im information you have available to you. Um, so I, I've never tried it. It, it might help. Um, but my initial thoughts are that I, I don't see that it would, would make a, a, a big difference one way or the other. Okay, and I have a question here from Mikhail Brunel. Um, I'm sorry, it's quite a long question. I'm gonna try to condense it down. Um, do you still recommend using 
a 125 hertz impulse response filtering for crossovers that are well below 90 hertz. Oh, why am I recommending the 125 hertz uh, filter in, in Sistune? Uh, yes, if it was, if the crossover was say at 60 hertz or somewhere quite low, or if you wanted to overlap the subs with the mains. Well, c keep in mind that those uh, filter frequencies that I mentioned in SysTune are not the crossover filter frequencies of the sound system. Um, if, if we're crossing over, say, at 80 hertz or 60, 70 hertz, that's fine. The, the filter frequencies that I was using in SysTune is only to limit the high frequency information coming out of the full range system so that the the full range system that we're measuring has similar uh, amount of high frequency content as the subwoofers because we weren't able to disable the low pass filter in our subs. So we don't want to take that, uh, that, that bandpass filter in SysTune all the way down to our crossover frequency uh, that we're using for our sound system. That would be too limiting. We want it to be above there a, a little bit. Um, you know, I was using, uh, in, in that, um, on the tools tab in SysTune, 125 hertz for, for the low pass filter. Um, if you're crossing over lower than 80 hertz, yeah, you could shift that down 100 or 90 hertz, uh, possibly. I've just found that using 125 hertz there seems to work fairly well. Now, when you apply that uh, one octave bandpass filter to the impulse response, um, the lowest option you have in SysTune is 125 hertz. Those are one octave uh, filters at one octave centers, and it, it, it starts at 125 and goes up. So that's the, the lowest you have there. But on the tools tab there for the low pass filter, um, yeah, you can certainly go lower uh, if, you're using, if, if your crossover frequency is lower, and that probably would be a, a better idea. Uh, I also have a question here from Lucas. Um, he does use Sistoon and, and he didn't know about uh, those specific configs you used. Uh, sorry. Uh, and with that, I bring you a question. What, are, what do you say to the people that are starting with Sistoon? What are the do's and don'ts? Ah, um, do's and don'ts with Sistoon. Um, use it. Uh, at home, in your shop, measure loudspeakers before you actually get out on site. Uh, become proficient with it, uh, become comfortable with it before you actually need to use it. Um, the other thing is uh, there are SysTune trainings offered uh, by AFMG partners. Uh, I am one, so disclaimer here. Um, but there are others uh, in, in Europe and um, South America, uh, other places. Um, attend those, those SysTune trainings. You'll learn a lot about SysTune there. Um, past that, I'm not sure there are really any do's and don'ts. Get in there, practice with it, play around with it. Uh, develop a workflow that, that works well for you. Um, I, I do see one question in, in the chat that uh, interests me, so I'll, I'll, I'll take that if you don't mind. Somebody asked about uh, the example where uh, I had initially put six milliseconds and things looked opposite. Why didn't I just reverse the polarity um, to, to make them align? So um, let me... Uh, that, that's a, an interesting question that I've, I kind of like. Uh, let me address that for just a second. Um, let me get this set back up so we see things. Um, okay, this is what the person I believe was speaking about. If we look when we had no delay, that was the time relationship. And initially, when I put six milliseconds of delay, that's the relationship. And if I inverted the polarity of the subwoofers, yeah, that does look like a pretty good alignment. But my thought is I never want to invert the polarity of anything unless I absolutely have to. 
And the only time I might have to invert the polarity of something as a, a loudspeaker designer is if I'm designing a passive crossover. Um, and, you know, there are cost considerations. I'm, I'm limited to the number of components I can use. If, if I'm dealing with DSP, um, I can put the right crossover filters on the devices um, so that I, I, I don't have to uh, do a polarity reversal to get 180 degrees of phase shift that is more properly gotten either with um, a higher order filter or with using an all pass filter. Um, with, with this kind of, of stuff, when I've got a DSP at my disposal, I never ever want to invert the polarity. Uh, it's, it's a great question and I am, am thankful that uh, someone asked it uh, so that I could address it, but it's, you, you, it might look like things are time aligned, but, but they're not. Um, and if we look at the phase, we can see that they're not phase aligned either they're going to be out of phase at our, our crossover region. Um, as you mentioned here, it, it looks like they're time aligned, but they're not. We've just inverted the polarity to make it look like they're time aligned. So in essence here, always go for, for the true time alignment, uh, if, if at all possible. I, I hope that uh, helped to answer the question. Uh, there's more one question here at the at the chat, but I think you are you already answered it. Is is about uh, the mic position with subarray subs in line arc delay? It's finding the minimum variance place. I think you already covered it. But if you want to go a bit deeper on that, uh, yeah. Um, if you've got a, a subwoofer array, uh, say <sighs> a, a straight array in front of the stage that you've used uh, delay to electronically arc the array. Um, the arrival time can, can get a little trickier there. Um, hopefully not too much because typically you're, um, you're delaying the outer loudspeakers more. So if you're off center, um, you know, between the, uh, the center subwoofer and let's say the house right uh, full range, then that delay that's been applied to the subwoofers actually pulls their arrival time between the center and the outside subwoofer closer together for that off center mic position. Um, so still, I would still treat the, the subwoofer array as a single entity uh, and not break it apart and, and look at that, uh, that total arrival time. And in terms of the difference in arrival time between the subwoofer array and the full range array, um, look at the setup. You know, like I said, pull out a laser range finder if you have one and measure places in the venue where you're, e try to find a place where that, the distance is the smallest difference between the two. You might find a place that, that's equidistant between them. That's probably where you wanna measure. Uh, and set up and, and do your alignment. It, it, it's going to depend on, on the room, the venue, uh, where the audience areas are. If, if it's all on one level, things are a lot easier. You introduce a balcony, things get a little more complicated or, you know, rake seating in, uh, in stadiums uh, can, can get a, a bit more complicated. So Charlie, I have a question. Yeah. Is aligning with the impulse response your preference over aligning with the phase? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, with most of the stuff that, that I'm doing, uh, I'm, I need to find the, the time alignment before any crossover filters are, are applied. Um, so naturally, the, the phase response is not going to be useful at all in doing that. I want to know what the, the real time alignment is. So the only way to do that's in, in the time domain. Now, okay. after, after the proper crossover filters have been applied, uh, you can do an alignment uh, and, and get a proper time, time alignment doing a phase alignment. Um, 
but you have to be in a large enough space so that you don't have a lot of reflected energy getting into the measurement. Mm -hmm. If you're in a, a small room, it, it can be very difficult to do that because you're, you're, you're not looking at the direct sound only. The, mm -hmm. the data is corrupted with reflections and reverberation. Yeah. 